And welcome back to the Test Studio Talk podcast. Today, we got a little bit of a different episode for you guys. It's going to be a bit of a spring sports update. We're going to be hitting on men's lacrosse, women's lacrosse, a little bit of baseball talk. Both lacrosse teams are heading into the NCAA tournament. Baseball's nearing the end of the season, only a couple games left in the regular season. So we're going to be catching up with all of the uh, beat reporters from testudotimes.com, uh, talking to them about their respective sports. You know, exciting episode. We got we got three separate interviews for you guys. Uh, I think it's going to be a lot of fun. Uh, got some good content out of these guys and, and a lot of good insight. Uh, Andrew, I know I'm excited, uh, you know, to, to get this podcast out there. It, it's a bit overdue. I think we talk about these spring sports. Absolutely. Completely overdue. These are three teams having enjoying really successful seasons, um, both across both across teams entering on the tournaments, hoping to go on deep runs for 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 the second year in a row. Baseball is one nine of ten, really playing their base, but their best baseball at the right time. So just a lot of really exciting things happening across Maryland spring sports right now, and excited to to dive into them with our with our beat, with our beat reporters. Absolutely, and you know, with uh, with football kind of that whole spring season over, and you know, basketball we're getting into the bit of the lulls of the summer. Uh, we're gonna have a lot of creative stuff uh, going on here at the Test Studio Talk podcast. So you know, remember to like subscribe, follow, rate comment whatever you do uh to you know help help us get good feedback and stuff that that always helps and it opens up new avenues for us yeah. uh so yeah uh we're gonna get right into the interviews we're not gonna keep you guys around too long in this this little intro segment um but yeah we're gonna have a uh, colin mcnamara talking men's lacrosse ryan allen are talking women's lacrosse then we got we got a twofer we got uh johnny akavachi and ben wolf talking baseball uh so so yeah, exciting episode. Uh, we're going to jump right into the first interview. I uh, hope you guys enjoy. All right. Well, this is the nature of uh, of this podcast, I guess. We're hopping right in. Uh, we didn't think there was going to be any uh, basketball or football news, but uh, here we are. Pablo Zuba, uh, Maryland forward, has just entered the transfer portal. Nothing surprising here. I think we've alluded to it here and, and on the site a bit um, kind of widely expected to go into the transfer portal and someone is going to have to on the team um, after Jordan Geronimo announced that he would come to Maryland. They were one over the scholarship limit. So Pablo Zuba, it is uh, no surprise. He never really played that much as a Terp. Uh, he started his career at Arizona state. He's a native of Ukraine as, as we all know. Um, yeah. I mean, we'll see, we'll see what's next for him uh, obviously, but uh, all we know is that he will not be with the Terps next year. Um, so Andrew, now we're 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 looking like the roster's probably finalized here. Uh, we're we're at the limit of, of thirteen scholarships for Kevin Willard's squad next year. So, uh, how would you rate uh, what they've done in the transfer portal so far? Uh, you know, given that it looks like they're probably about done uh, making moves. Yeah, I mean, obviously they didn't get the big fish in in, in Hunter Dickinson, but you know they got some solid some solid pieces. Chance Stevens, a guy who can you know who can shoot the three ball. Got Jordan Geronimo, a guy. Ton of size, ton of size, athleticism, um, good length, can play really from the three to the five. So I think you know, I think Willard, I think he put in some some nice pieces to solidify um, his roster for the upcoming season. And again, yeah, this was really no surprise with Zuba, just a casualty of the transfer portal. Really, um, very some widely expected news, but yeah, it definitely seems like Maryland's twenty three twenty four roster is is basically set. Yeah, and obviously we'll you know we'll we'll, we'll be monitoring uh, to see if anything comes up, but. Uh... The way it looks right now is that is that you know they're right at that scholarship limit and and now they're gonna have to start you know moving more pieces around yeah. um to you know bring anyone else in you know arno rivas and pablo zubo were kind of those last guys at the end of the bench at least when it came to forwards so you know like you said kind of an unfortunate uh casualty of the transfer portal you know you're bringing guys like like geronimo and stevens um you know is some, someone has to go uh, you know given the guys that came back you know given dante scott coming back at a Kind of similar-ish position, so um, yeah. Well, I mean, we'll 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 see what happens next season. Uh, I think that Pablo wasn't going to play that much. I think we all know that. I think that he wouldn't have left if he thought he was going to play a lot, and I think Kevin Willard wouldn't have let him leave if he thought he was going to play a lot. Um, yeah, I mean, when you look at the front court, and we'll we'll talk briefly about the front court here. Uh, you know, obviously, we want to keep this episode focused on uh, on spring sports, uh, but um, when you look at the front court, you know, like you said, Hunter Dickinson is not coming to Maryland. You know, it, not really surprising there. You know, they were they were in the thick of it to the end, but it could go either way. Um, you look at you know the starting lineup. Uh, you're likely going to be seeing another lineup of uh, of Jameer at the one. Uh, probably going to see Deshaun Harris Smith, the freshman, at the two, and then Dante Scott at the four, and Julian Reese at the five. It's really that three spot where where you're going to maybe see a little bit of question marks. You know, maybe Ian Martinez gets a start. 
maybe you yeah. see the freshman Jamie Kaiser impress. Uh, I, I don't know if you have, you know, anyone that you would prefer from, from what you've seen, uh, you know, obviously it's early and, and you know, it's, Kaiser it's, isn't even on campus yet. Yeah. I, I think you put you nailed it right there. It's, it's so early, right? I mean, we're not going to, I mean, the roster is probably going to change four times by from, from, from the months of October to December. It's not, but I mean, if I had a, I a prediction right now, I think Martinez would probably, you know, slide, slide into that extra spot. So, and, but again, you know, Deshaun Howard Smith, he's, he's a freshman, right? He, he might not pad out as, as expected, you know, early on, you know, Jamie Kaiser might be felt like nobody knows. So it's, it's not, I don't really think it's right to guess before these guys have even stepped on the court for practice, but you know, there's again, a lot of moving pieces, really excited to see what, what the roster ends up, you know, shaping up in the next few months. Yeah. And specifically at that, that Pablo Zuba position group, you know, he's, he's not really in the rotation, but uh, you know, Julian Reese is going to be back out there at the five. It looks like you know, his big problem last year, it seemed like, was was foul trouble. And, you know, he couldn't stay on the court. And now, you know, you don't get Dickinson. And uh, it looks like you're probably going to be relying on either Geronimo to to play some minutes at the five if you're running, you know, a little bit of small ball. And, you know, you're expecting or Cal Swan Roger to, you know, step up. It would have been a, I would have been personally, you know, we, we don't need to harp too much on Dickinson because, you know, he's not, he's not going to play for Maryland next year. But uh, – I would have loved to see the conversations between the two after after Swat and Roger dunked on him in that game. Might have <laughs> might have created a little bit of a locker room issue. Uh, but yeah, you're going to probably need to see uh, CSR step up a bit, play some more minutes. Um, you know, you're hoping for that that sophomore jump, uh, and then Braden Pierce is coming in as a freshman, the seven footer, probably more of a developmental piece. So I, I would honestly not be surprised at all if he red shirts next year. So I, I also don't. Again, tell, you tell me if, if I'm completely wrong here. I don't think it's crazy to think that Willard might go searching for another big man in the portal and try to make some moves before the, before the start of the season. You were with the team last season. Just your thoughts on that. I think he could. And I think that that is, if you're going anywhere in the portal, um, that's the place you look, right? You look at the front court depth yeah. and, you know, there are some question marks there. I think that's probably the biggest question mark on Maryland's roster is, you know, it's going to be a, probably a similar team to last year, you know, just kind of replace, uh, you know, you replace Don Carey and Hakeem Hart in the starting lineup. But in terms of the makeup of the team, it's going to be pretty reliant on that starting five, you would think. Mm-hmm. And if the depth is what, what you're going to be looking at, they look a lot deeper than last year. I mean, I, I like the addition of Geronimo. I think mm-hmm. he's going to play that role well. Um, and, you know, you still got guys like Jahari Long and one of Martinez and Kaiser coming off the bench. I think they have a pretty good bench. But, you know, the the big spot that you're looking at is that front court. And you're looking at, at really at the five. I mean, you know, they, they have guys that can plug and play here. You know, Dante Scott's played the five before, but in the Big Ten, I don't, you know, <laughs> Julian Reese is going to have to to work his way out of foul trouble. So, uh, yeah, like you said, if they're going in the portal, it's going to be for a big man. I just can't see them doing it personally because okay. then you have to push someone else out. You know, if you had a scholarship okay. to play with, yeah. then maybe you do it. But, you know, then then you're starting to look at pushing someone out. And realistically, if you're looking at the rotation, you're probably pushing out a front court player. So, no, I don't know. I don't know if you would take a guy like Swanton Roger or take a guy like Pierce if, if you just kind of were going to replace their scholarship immediately. Um, I think there's only a couple of days left uh, of guys being able to enter the transfer portal. So if anything's going to happen, it's going to happen in the next couple of days. But m- my my personal guess is that they're not going to is that this this is going to be the roster for next year. These these 13 guys are going to be the scholarship players. And then, you know, you're gonna have the walk ons in there as well. I, I think the roster is pretty much finalized. Yeah. probably not worth speculating the specifics of of the rotation until we have a clearer picture but yeah you know just early thoughts on, on what we might come to expect yeah i mean you know we're just we're just kind of you know spitballing here you know summer summer is really where kevin willard uh <laughs> you know he, this is this is where his reputation is for player development is, is really over the summer so we'll yeah. definitely uh have some reports at a summer camp uh seeing who's progressing i know that once Jameer Young got on campus in the summer, they immediately were like, this is our best player. So I'll be certainly interested to see what Deshaun Harris-Smith does. Uh, top 25 freshman in the country, you know, Bronny James just committed to USC. People aren't talking about is <laughs> one spot ahead of him. He is one spot ahead of him, that is. And if they yeah. both stay for two years, it'll, it'll be a Big Ten matchup. <laughs> I think that makes sense. It's true. That's, that's, a, that's, that's, that's so weird. That's still so yeah, weird. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> well, we'll, 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 we won't be covering uh, – we won't be covering that, but that, that is going to take quite an adjustment. Imagine saying, you know, when Maryland joined the Big Ten in 2014, imagine saying 10 years ago, Maryland and USC, <laughs> the LeBron James Jr. Imagine even saying that the Paul the Sixth point guard is going to play for Maryland. That might be just as crazy. 
yeah that's yeah that yeah <laughs> Yeah, well, uh, yeah, like we said, there's not too much to take away from from Pablo Zuba entering the transfer portal. Obviously, we'll wish him well, see where he goes. You know, we'll update whenever we get news on that. Uh, I can kind of say that he's been looking for probably like a month or so, you know, for for a new new home. So I, I would expect that this process won't take too long. Uh, so yeah, we'll, we'll we'll keep everyone updated on that. Um, and now we'll we'll get to the meat of the episode. We'll get we'll get into the spring sports interviews. Uh, yeah, but uh, but wanted to get this quick men's basketball update in there just to hit on the recent news and uh, let you guys know that we're on top of everything. And now we are joined by Testudo Times men's lacrosse beat reporter Colin McNamara. Colin, how are you doing? Doing great, Evan. How are you? Doing well. Excited to have you on. Terps were just selected as the number four overall seed in the NCAA tournament. First game will be this weekend. Colin, what have you seen from the Terps this year? that made you think that they're deserving of that number four seed or perhaps anything that you think maybe uh, is of concern? Well, the kind of story behind this season is just kind of the highs and lows. John Tillman mentioned it this morning, um, saying that when they're good, they're really good. When they're bad, they're really bad. Um, That's just kind of been the story throughout this entire season. Um, It's just been inconsistency, but they have one of the highest RPIs in the nation. They play in the Big Ten, one of the best conferences. Um, so, and John Tillman said today that, you know, he, you can get criticism for getting the number four seed all you want, but at the end of the day, there haven't been many teams that have had, faced the the challenging schedule that they have and they fared well, you know, 10 wins is nothing to, you know, be ashamed of. Um, it's not the undefeated seasons of the, of the last two years, but 10 wins is 10 wins against a really challenging schedule. Yeah, I'll often hear, you know, something that Tillman said, I believe a week ago, is that, you know, that team doesn't have an alpha male and an alpha player. What have you seen from the freshmen, from their attackers, and how they've been able to progress throughout the season? Yeah, so, yeah, like you mentioned, um, Tillman even said it after the the Michigan game that they don't really have that alpha male to go to. They don't have the Logan Wisnowskis. They don't have the Jared Bernhardt. They don't have that that alpha guy that they can go to to just get a goal from them when they really need it. But, you know, Braden Erksa has – really come on here i mean he's i i I would suppose he's gonna be wearing the number one jersey in a in a year or two now um you know coming to the season he started a little slow but since that like midway point he's just he's just been the go-to guy um over daniel mullet and daniel kelly who are both upperclassmen um irksa just a great dodger someone that can get into the heart of the defense he can facilitate extremely well um i think he's second on the team in assists behind kyle long um, second on the team in goals, I believe, behind Daniel Maltz. But um, that's a guy that can kind of really do it all, and he's he's gonna have to be their go-to guy down the stretch if they want to, you know, make 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 some noise here. You mentioned that number one jersey, you know, the guy wearing it this year, first ever defenseman Brett Makar. You know, we know what we're getting from Brett Makar, you know, all-American kind of player, and he's alongside Ajax Apatello. But Ajax has been hurt the last couple games. Do you have any info on his status moving forward? And if he's not able to go, what does Maryland's defense look like heading into, you know, its most important games of the year? Right. So, yeah, John Tillman has, even with the Logan um, uh, McNanny injury in the beginning of the year, he's kind of a little bit cautious about what he says with players' injuries, and he hasn't given a direct diagnosis to Ajax, um, at least to the press or the media. But um, earlier, about two weeks ago, he said that, there's a chance he comes back for the rest of the season, although it doesn't look good as of right now as he's wearing a cast on his hand. He has a hand injury. That's one thing that's confirmed. Um, yeah, and if he's not good to go, um, it really stunts kind of the identity of Maryland because while their offense has been inconsistent, relying on um, underclassmen, their defense has kind of really been where they thrived. thrived. Um, and when you don't have Ajax and John Gabbard, who's also banged up a little bit, but he's their long stick midfielder, so he's not even in on you know every single defensive possession. But when Ajax isn't in there, it's 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 Brett Mocker and then six new guys around him that weren't playing last year. So just the experience is something that Brett kind of attested to of the advantage of having Ajax next to him. And this this team is really young. Um, to be to be in the position they are now with with the experience that they have is, is quite impressive. Honestly, I think they're going to be a really good team to come or really good team in the years to come, but yeah, just, just the experience is really what they're going to miss with Ajax. 
Yeah, Colin, kind of wanted to step back a few days to the Big Ten Tournament Championship. Obviously, a really surprising defeat against Michigan. What were some of the challenges you saw in that game that you think they might face in the Big Ten tour in the NCAA tournament, how they can overcome them? Right, yeah. So um, it just seemed like from the get-go, Michigan just kind of had their number. Um, uh, they, Michigan said in, in, in the post-game press conference that they figured out a formula against Maryland the first game when they beat them 16-11 in the regular season. And they've used that formula throughout the rest of the season to kind of get to where they are now as, as Big Ten champions. And they obviously used that formula in the championship game. And it just, again, it was, it was the offensive inconsistencies and, and, and defense as well, honestly, without Ajax, with Kep, uh, John Kepard banged up. Um, they, they allowed 10 goals in the, in the first half. And then the second half, Michigan was just kind of able to run at the clock and they, weren't, they didn't have to be aggressive. And Maryland only scored one goal in the second half. I mean, it's, it's just kind of been, been the story of the season. It's just, it, it's just inconsistency. You don't, you don't really know what you're going to get on a, a day in day out basis for them. They played great against John Hopkins in the semifinals, but then against Michigan, it's, it's turnovers. Um, it's, it's missed shots. It's, it's not being able to get, you know, into the heart of the defense, get, get easy looks. Um, there are, there are countless times where it's just in the third and fourth quarter, it's just, they're, they're throwing up desperation shots. Um, they're, they're, they're smothered on defense. The shot clock's winding down. They just chuck and it sails over the goal. Um, and I, to the point earlier, it's just, they're missing a guy like Logan Wisnowskis that can come in and kind of just settle the offense down. Um, but I think, uh, Tillman has preached, you know, be just being cleaner with the ball, getting good looks, um, not settling for the first shot and maybe, you know, waiting for a better shot is kind of, uh, something that he's been preaching throughout the season, something that I'm sure they're going to work on during practice. Um, and they've got a really good defense and army coming up. So um, it'll be interesting to see how they how they prepare for that. Well, I think one guy that's kind of embodied these ups and downs of this year has been the freshman goalie, Brian Rupel. You know, obviously had to come in after uh, Logan McNaney got hurt and then Teddy Dolan didn't play too well against Syracuse. What have you seen from him this year that has allowed him to kind of blossom in the starting role? But then also sometimes, you know, the freshman struggles come out. Right. Um, yeah, throughout his entire year, Brian Rupel has just been extremely impressive. Um, and you mentioned the freshman struggles as kind of the thing that happened against Michigan, and that's just going to happen throughout your freshman season. Um, you know, obviously Logan has had the, the, the privilege of, of playing, um, throughout the last couple of years, but yeah, Brian Rupel, this is his still, still his first postseason, still his first 15 games or so that he's playing in. So you just there, there needs to be some patience there with the freshman goalie. There's just gonna be times where he's gonna be rattled. You know, scoring 10 goals in the first half is not an easy thing to kind of look up at the scoreboard at. Um, but he all in all throughout the season, um, I obviously the coaching staff, I'm sure, is very, very happy with Brian Ruppel. Um, he's definitely gonna be their, you know, goalie of the future. Um, he's a great player. Um, uh, he's a really nice guy. Um, seems to kind of had his head on straight. And you mentioned Teddy Dolan has done a great job. Um, at, you know, kind of mentoring him and not really kind of, at, you know, getting annoyed that a freshman's taking a spot as a graduate student. But um, I think, I think Rupal has a great support system. Um, and I, I, I think, I think he'll fare well in the postseason here as, um, you know, he has a full week of preparation because that was something they didn't have going to the Johns Hopkins game or Michigan game was they were both playing on, you know, short weeks of preparation. Yeah, you mentioned Army's defense, you know, a team that allows just over eight goals per game. You know, what can Maryland do to it to ensure that, you know, that consistent offense comes out in Saturday's game instead of the one that, you know, that we've seen that you mentioned the inconsistencies? Right. Yeah, Um. again, it's just kind of the story throughout the, the whole season. It's just taking care of the ball. Um. Maryland, in most of the games that they lose, it's, it's turning the ball over 18, 19, 20 times a game. Um. And I think a lot of that would be taken care of with the return of Owen Murphy. Um, he's played sparingly over the last few weeks, um, but he's, he's an experienced guy uh, for them and in a spot where they need an experienced guy. Owen Murphy has been, he played the, played kind of a, the attacker role in the beginning of the season, but it's kind of shifted more towards a midfielder role now. And I think um, his leadership, his experience, being able to take care of the ball, his, you know, just level of, of lacrosse iq of just knowing what to do with the ball and when i think is really going to fare well for the for the terps and obviously you, you have you have kyle long and jack horace and jack brennan all in that starting midfield who are gonna have to gonna have to play well they're all gonna have to take care care of the ball and obviously Braden Erksa, we mentioned him um he's 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 gonna have to be 
he's gonna have to be great um honestly and eric spanos scored three goals against michigan um i think those are going to be the two guys that they're going to rely on to kind of get those kind of athletic buckets or goals when you need it um and and then rely on the the experienced vets to kind of put them in a position to score i think this could be our last question and we can get you out of here you mentioned all of the ups and downs all of the inconsistencies you kind of never know what you're getting kind of a low floor, high ceiling team, it seems like this year. With the draw they have, Army in the first round, in the quarterfinals, it would be either Penn State or Princeton. And then obviously once you get to the final four, it's the best of the best. What do you think this team is capable of in the NCAA tournament? And likewise, what do you expect from them? Right. Yeah, I mean, at the end of the day, it's still Maryland lacrosse. So there's, and they're the number four seed. So there's no doubt that they can still win the national championship here. But they're gonna have they're gonna have to put together a string of you know these four really good games, which something that they haven't been able to do throughout the season. They haven't been able to string together four really good games. It seemed like they might have had that in the beginning of the Big Ten tournament. They played Rockers really well. They played John Hopkins really well, and then they fell to Michigan. It's just it's just can they keep this level of play up throughout the entire tournament? Is something that's going to be you know a big question coming in. So I think their ceiling, uh, absolutely, um, uh, is a national championship and going back to back, but um, as far as expe expectations, again, it's, it's just hard to tell what team we're going to see. Um, I mean, I can tell you that I, I would expect them to beat Army at home as a number four seed, but as far as that point on, it's it's kind of a question mark is if they can beat Penn State again, if they can string together like this consecutive play of of scoring well and playing good defense and, and, the, and the injuries with with Ajax and John Gepard is, is something that's definitely going to be something to keep an eye on. Great. Well, Colin, we really appreciate you coming on. We appreciate your time and everyone that's listening or watching. You can uh, keep up to date with all of Colin's coverage at testudotimes.com. As always, Colin, thanks for coming on. Thanks, Colin. Thank you guys for having me. We're excited to be uh, welcomed by the Testudo Times Women's Lacrosse beat reporter, Ryan Alonado. Ryan, how are you today? Good. How are you? Pretty good. Pretty good. So, you know, with the Big Ten, with the NCAA tournament coming up, I just wanted to get your thoughts on, you know, Maryland being unseated for the first time in, you know, over 15 years. Just what are your thoughts on the season so far and where they are headed into the tournament? Uh, well, I think overall they've had a pretty good season. Um, I think in terms of their record, I think it compares to the 21, 2021 season pretty well. Um, I think obviously they didn't live up to their billing since last year, but I mean, last year they had arguably the best attacker in the country, Aurora accordingly. Obviously, she graduated. Um, and so some of those totals have gone down um, in terms of goal scoring. But I still think that um, I said that they think that they've performed pretty well this year. Um, I think that's something that they have done well uh, is consistently improving on the defensive side and um, continuing to do well on draw controls, because I think, think that that's something that they pride themselves on. Um, I think that sometimes they can run into a little bit of trouble on attack if they slow things down too much. I think they work best when they uh, when they speed things up and move quickly because I think that highlights their athleticism and skill. Um, but overall, I uh, I think that they have a good chance in this tournament if they can um, if they can play uh, t to their ceiling, which obviously we've seen them do in some of these games. I think their best game this year um, was probably in that late win over Florida. Um, number seven Florida at the time but if they played at their ceiling I think that they can make a far run well we've seen a fair share of all Big Ten nominees on this team obviously and you know another Kathy Reese star-studded squad who do you think is kind of the x factor heading into the NCAA tournament that you're keeping an eye on that that maybe could be the difference whether they they're an early bounce or whether they make another deep run mm -hmm. so I think that in terms of the player that you know everyone's probably going to say um, it would be Abby Bosco um, I think she's overall the best player on this team. She won, I think, Big Ten Defender of the Year last year. Um, she's a tour to nominee this year. Um, obviously exceptional on defense. She doesn't necessarily have the size, the prototypical size of a defenseman. Um, but overall, I think that her tenacity um, and her willingness to get the ball is, is it bodes well for this defense um, that is going to need to force a lot of turnovers in, in, in some of these competitive games. Um, and then also her her effect on the draw control circle um, along with Shaylin Ahern. She's not, Abby Bosco's not taking the draws, but, but every time Shaylin wins it, you know, it's, it's typically going to Abby and that's how they're able to dominate on the draws. So 
I think that she's the X factor right there. And then someone that, you know, you might not think of immediately is Kate Seitz on attack. Um, the reason I say this is because she, she did pretty well in the, uh, in the big 10 tournament, she kind of came alive, scored four goals, uh, off the bench. And I think that she's a speedy player, someone that can dodge quickly. And, and it's another depth piece that, that, um, I think Reese can utilize well. Yeah, Ryan, you mentioned Shay Ahern. She was just named the Big Ten Midfielder of the Year, obviously a huge component in this Terps uh, midfield. There have been, I think, some injury concerns with her in the past few games. Can you just kind of give us an update on that and just what her impact is when she's not off the field and how much and how important she is for the Terps if they want to go on a run here? Well, I think that she's probably the second most important player behind Bosco. Um, just because I, she's leading the Big Ten draw controls with, I think it's 131 right now. Um, obviously, that's what Maryland does so well, and they've done so well over the past 10 years, uh, is winning draw controls. They had um, Taylor Cummings, who's one of the best ever to do it. Um, but yeah, she got, she aggravated an ankle during the, uh, th during the Northwestern match, um, and they had to tape it up pretty well. Um, and it kind of hindered her performance there. And then she came back in the fourth quarter, uh, but by then the game was kind of out of reach. So you could see the kind of impact that that, that was uh, lost when she wasn't out there. Um, in her absence, you know, Haley Russo, sophomore, and Shannon Smith, who's also typically on draw control duty, kind of took over for her. But obviously they weren't able to, you know, keep that same amount of production. So that's definitely something to look for uh, coming up in these games is if she's healthy enough, if she's available, um, that might be the biggest question mark heading into these games. Um, but overall, I would say that her impact is, is extremely profound. I would like to highlight maybe one more uh, player that, that has, it seemed dealt with uh, a little bit of injuries this year, uh, Corey Edmondson. Coming on the scene as a freshman and having the impact that she has, I mean, what kind of difference has she made for this team and, and what kind of player could she be moving forward for this program? Absolutely. Um, I think that she has the potential to be, if she's not already, the most well-rounded player on this team. She is on the draw control circle consistently. Um, and then Re she's gained Reese's trust on both the offensive and defensive sides of the ball. Um, I think she has the second most goals behind Libby May on the team. She has like 38 or 39. Um, and, and she scores in a consistent type of manner, uh, typically from the wing, uh, where she's so effective at, at, at dodging. And then, and then she's so accurate with her shooting that it's nearly impossible to stop. And that's what makes her that number one type of threat. Um, and, and obviously the number one recruit this past year. And then on defense, uh, she's consistently walking up on the perimeter. I mean, Maryland plays so well man coverage uh, and she's a big component of that. So I think in the future, um, even like beyond this tournament and beyond this year, she obviously has the opportunity, I think, to be one of the best players in the country. I think she'll be a multiple time tour to nominee. Um, if she doesn't even win it uh, in these next few years, I think she she has that type of potential. Yeah, right. I kind of want to take it back to earlier in the season. You know, it's the first time we're having you on the podcast, you know, so something we've seen for this Maryland team in the past few years is they've kind of, you know, they've blown teams out of the water, but you know, this season, they had a tough start to the season at 500. It's kind of seemed like the offense was still trying to find it, find its rhythm without, or were accordingly leading it. What have you seen, you know, how, how have you seen this team grow um, throughout the season and improve uh, to get some quality wins and what areas do you think they still need to grow in as, as, as we had the NCAA tournament? Um, well, I think at the beginning of the season, they weren't really gelling as much as they are now. I think a communication and teamwork is a big factor. And that's something that they've told uh, us reporters in the press conferences is that, you know, we're just looking to keep building on the practices and building on these games and these experiences. Um, so I think it was a little bit of a process at the start. You have a lot of new transfers coming in. Um, you had some red shirt people like uh, Kennedy major on defense and, and Marge Donovan who transferred from Princeton. Um, and then it was about also incorporating some of the freshmen and like, uh, like Corey Edmondson and then Maggie Wiseman on attack. Um, but as the season's gone on, they've gotten better at adapting, I think, both on the offensive and defensive end. Um, and as of late, they, they, there seem to be at that point where it's just about getting these last few, you know, like nitpicky things together. I think that the offenses in defense and draw control circle, the, the midfield, I think they're all operating extremely well. 
um, compared to where they were when they lost 20 and 11 against uh, Syracuse and they, you know, couldn't seem to get the ball out of their own end and, you know, they couldn't seem to cover very well. Uh, but now the, the the communication on the slides is a lot better on defense and and on offense. It seems like they're executing a lot more smoothly. It seems like people know when they're supposed to cut. Um, it seems like they know like where people are supposed to be more often than 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 where they were when they were losing against uh, the teams in the beginning of the season. Well, that all being said, I, I'm I want to get your input on, on the draw they got. You know, in the NCAA tournament, we talked about them being unseated. You know, Drexel in the first round, a uh, potential. Second round matchup against JMU, you know, Kathy Reese and the Terps, they've kind of been a mainstay in the final four. I mean, last year, they just barely couldn't overcome, you know, Charlotte North and Boston College in the semifinal. But do you think this team has what it takes to, to you know, make another run at a national championship in a final four? Or do you think that maybe these these early teams could give them some problems? Um, I think it could be a little bit of both, honestly. Um, I think that both can be true. I think that some of these teams early on can give them a little bit of trouble. Uh, even Drexel, I think when you when it, when it gets to playoff lacrosse, you even saw in the Big Ten tournament, um, some of those teams that they were beating handily, like Ohio State earlier in the season, that might have been one of their best and most dominant wins. They played a closer game against them. Um, and then when it came to Northwestern, you you saw the opposite. Like, I think that they played Northwestern extremely closely in that first half. And then even in that second half, I think if they had Shailen Ahern, um, I think that game was even, would have been even closer and that. And that's the number one seeded team in the country. That's the best team right now. Um, and, and I think they can stick with them any day of the week. I think that they just got a little bit tired at the end, um, honestly. So I, I do think that they can make a big run if they, if they lock in, honestly, it's, it's just going to come down to that. And, you know, you, like you said, you have Drexel here, which you can't overlook. And then you have J James Madison, who they did lose to earlier in the season but that was when they were still working on, you know, bringing everything together. Um, I think they're a better team than they even were then. Um, obviously not looking too far ahead, but I think that they have a chance to play uh, Syracuse if they win that game. And, and that's going to be the true testament. Um, obviously, I think that that would also be a closer game. Um, so it's kind of hard to compare games earlier in the season to where they are now, but they are, are they're considerable, considerable amount better, uh, in my opinion. And I think they have a chance to go far. Yeah, Ryan, just a little more specific in, into the games that, that Maryland has played. Just looking looking at some of their recent losses, they've they've lost three or three of their of, of their past six. A common theme that that I've seen is that in the first half, they've, you know, played, played, played well, have kept games close, but then the second half, it seems like other teams are kind of starting to take to take advantage. Is that a theme that that you've seen throughout the season? Maybe they're not getting a full 16 minute effort. And is that something that Catherine has spoken on? Yeah, I think she's spoken on that a little bit, but I think more so not just the effort part, but it's about she's talked about the execution part. So they've been executing in the first half very well uh, against teams like Penn State and against Northwestern. But one thing that she's always told us reporters over the course of the season is shoot at 50 percent. She wants a 50 percent shooting percentage. Um, and they haven't always had that in these games, especially in the second half. So I think that's something uh, that she's definitely going to want out of these games in the tournament. I think that's a specific thing that you can point to in these games where they might have some shortcomings and it's, it's where they get a little bit too lazy, either on offense or something like that. And, you know, they end up with a, with a, not as good of a shot as they would have wanted. Um, so they're getting the shot clocks running down and, you know, they have to just fire away and, you know, whereas in the first half they're locked in and they're running their offense um, so I think that's, that's something that, uh, people should look, look to see if they can convert on more than 50% of their chances. And if they can, then it'll, it'll be better for them. It'll bode better, bode better for them. I want to get one more question in before we let you go. Um, just get your score prediction for, for Friday night's game against Drexel, you know, first round of the NCAA tournament, obviously there's going to be some jitters, but, uh, but I'm curious to, uh, to hear what, what you think result of that game is going to be and, and, you know, whether the Terps will be moving on or not. Yeah. I, I see a pretty handily, uh, you know, I, I see a pretty handily uh, beatable like Maryland victory uh, in that game. I would say, I don't, I don't know if I can throw it an exact score, but I think they beat them by about, by about five or six last time. I've actually, it might've been more than that. Um, I don't know what the exact score was for that one, um, but I could see them beating them by seven or eight, honestly. Um, it's going to be a bounce back type of game for them. So it's, it's all about the mindset they, that they have going into it. If they, if they play down, 
to uh, Drexel's level. It could obviously be closer, but I don't see that happening. I don't see them playing down to to that team's level. I I think when they've had opponents over the course of the year that they should be beating, I think that they have done it well. Like you know, obviously the William and Mary game is the, is the most prominent. Ohio State over the course of, during the regular season, Drexel. Um, St. Joseph's teams like that, where they should be beating them, they haven't really played down to their opponents as much. Um, so I, I definitely see them winning the the first round matchup over Drexel, especially with Kathy Reese's um, turn, NCAA tournament coaching experience. She's going to make sure that they're ready to go and and locked in and ready to win the first game. Yeah, absolutely, Ryan. Ethan, thanks so much for you know for hopping on the pod today, and for anyone, anyone listening, you can uh, watch the Terps first round game against Drexel uh, this Friday uh, against Drexel at five PM. And uh, thanks again, Ryan, for hopping on. Yeah, no problem. Thank you for having me. All right, now it's time for some baseball talk, and we are joined by Maryland's Maryland baseball beat reporters for TestudoTimes dot com, Ben Wolf and John Iacovacci. Guys, how are you doing today? Doing great. How are you guys? Thanks doing well. Us. Excited to have you guys on and, and, and talk some Maryland baseball. Yeah. John, I'll start with you. Uh, you covered the last game. Maryland, another series win in the Big Ten. They haven't lost one in a couple couple years, it seems like now. Uh, seems like they're playing their best baseball of the year. Uh, would you agree with that statement? Do you think that that they are, in fact, playing uh, playing their best baseball right now at the right time? I definitely think so. I think that the Maryland baseball team had started a really tough start with a non conference that they had, uh, dropping a bad series to Ole Miss, losing one to USF, and then getting swept in the Cambria College Classic. They started four and seven on the year. Now they're just clicking on all cylinders. I just said on the last game, they scored 20 runs, the most, the most they've ever scored in a Big Ten game. They've been putting up an uh, insurmountable amount of runs in the past couple games or the past three weeks. They've just been a whole different team, in my opinion, um, and just putting consistent at-bats from one to nine at this point. Yeah, and then I, you know, I'll, I'll kind of second that. It seems the past, you know, they've, they've, they've won nine of their past ten. It seems like the bats are, are clicking on, on, else, on all cylinders. What do you think has kind of contributed, uh, to any of you guys, has contributed to the, uh, to the offensive explosion that we've seen in, in the past few weeks? Um, I think, like, especially at the beginning of the year, like, they were putting it, they were scoring runs, they were putting good at bats together, but like just like that luck was on their side. Like they they were hit, they're hitting the ball hard, getting loud outs, but like now they've like really been able to find those gaps. And especially in the Bob being a, a hitter's uh, ballpark, like they've just been mashing the ball and scoring, hitting more home runs, and they're, they're getting runs with guys in scoring position. And it's just lead, what's really led this entire offense, and especially with. Russo, Sean Schliger, uh, Schliger, the big top three is really just helping um, the rest of the lineup produce. I mean, the biggest thing uh, with this offense is that you don't get to rest. There's a big three, obviously, as Ben was saying, but you'll one and nine. Uh, the uh, the offense averages like the the team OPS is above a thousand, which is unheard of. Like this team, top to bottom, Kevin Keister's at the nine. He's been great. He was almost Big Ten Player of the Week last week. Hit four home runs in two games. You have Eddie Acopian. You have Bobby Zamarzlak. Like the bottom, Elijah Lambros. All these guys, they're like fantastic. It, like they would be a star on other teams. And what makes the offense so special compared to the Big Ten and maybe even in the nation is how deep the offense is. I think you could probably put. I mean, I think it's like a rotation of like eleven to twelve guys that are just fantastic. Yeah, and if you also even oh, go ahead, or, ben. like the even the guys who aren't like the main starters, like you got Jacob Orr who got start um, yesterday. He had a big homer, and when he's been in the lineup, he's been able to produce. And like when Matt Woods was injured, you had Zach Martin. Vaughn was telling us that he hasn't really had like a really meaningful at bats yet. He just took advantage of that opportunity and played. He it, uh, he hit the ball hard in his at bats and also played stellar defense in the field. So it's just, it really shows you that the entire Maryland roster is deep. Yeah, and no doubt about that. I do want to harp uh, a little bit on, on the middle of the order guys, like you guys were talking about, you know, the two, three hitters for most of the games, Matt Shaw and Nick LaRusso seem to be pretty much playing like maybe the two best hitters in the Big Ten right now. 
what do you think has allowed them to kind of take that next step this year? I mean, last year they were great players, obviously, but it seems like they've kind of taken it to a whole nother level. Um, I would definitely say it's experience. Like when you face these, when you face the higher level uh, competitors, that's when you get more and more comfortable. And Shaw had the great summer and especially like, coaching staff like Matt Swope, like every single time I'm at a media availability, any player, they they praise Swope and all his tactics. And I think that's what's really helped them make that next step. I mean, yeah, as, as Ben was saying, like the cape for both Schliger and Shaw have been fantastic on their development. Um, I know like what I've seen from Schliger and LaRusso's uh, development in the winter uh, with their competition um, between each other and then just uh, like as you said Swope has been a massive part on how well this team has been um, just in regards to developing hitting talent um, but also Matt Shaw, Nick LaRusso or especially Shaw is probably there he's a top 20 player in the MLB draft coming up just a amazing talent one of the best players Maryland baseball has seen in their history so it's just the insurmountable amount of talent um, on that top of the order that is really like it's it's pushing them to like heights that they haven't seen before yeah guys and and and, and while the hitting has been so good you know a, a large topic of concern throughout the season ha- has been maryland's pitching and you know their starting trio that we've seen of nick dean jason Savin, Savicool, and kyle mccoy you know what do you think maryland's limitations can be in the, with the postseason arriving with their pitching staff and then i know that there have also been some injury concerns with the three of them can you guys kind of give us an, an update on that front yeah so what i've heard is that dean and Savicool are both dealing with with limited injuries so dean has had the forearm tightness and savicool has dealt with back stiffness um he also savicool while he has pitched really good outings i think he might have one of the lowest areas on the team he's been he's also a top prospect in the coming mlb draft uh savicool has pitched like upwards of like 100 innings in every single like appearance he's had so it's something that vaughn has concern in with coming into the big 10 tournament and then uh, potentially the ncaa tournament as for the rest of the staff, Kyle McCoy is very on and off. He'll do a Big Ten Pitcher of the Week performance or Freshman of the Week performance, and then he'll put up like eight earned runs in the next performance like he did against Nebraska. So he's a very good pitcher. He's very good for uh, pitching week contact, um, but it's really hit or miss. He's a freshman, so he's trying to get into it. As for the rest of the staff, I mean, it's been a race against the bullpen this year, unfortunately. Um, I said in the Ole Miss game, they put up eight runs. They got mercy ruled. They allowed 18. Um, a lot of times in these midweeks, the bullpen has just been lackluster. What I have seen is that a lot of pitchers like are improving. Um, I think Logan Ott has been like better as of late. We've seen Ryan Van Buren was very bad in the beginning. He's been a consistent arm. He's been able to pitch a bulk amount of innings. Uh, the other pitchers, Nigel Belgrave has been good. David Falco has been good. Not as good as maybe the hype came in, but they've been good. And then Kenny Littman, he did not have a good start in his last outing. But I think the important part is when we're talking about pitching into the postseason is can you have like pitchers that can pitch long innings? And when you have people like you have your starting three, but then you have Ryan Van Buren can put up four to five innings. Kenny Littman can put up four to five innings. Nate Havathier has not been good this year, but he could put up a bulk amount of innings. I think that's the most important part. So you don't have to go to like, Last year, they were doing two-way players and just putting out, like, you don't want to go to, like, a Matt Orlando this year, like, and when you go to, like, the NCAA tournament or the Big Ten tournament. I agree, and I, I think that while it was it has been a rough year for the bullpen, it seems that they are finally fi- uh, hitting their stride, which is the perfect time to hit it. Um, Like like John said, uh, Kenny Littman, he was outstanding on, on the Friday game against it. Uh, Nebraska I think he went either three to four innings and he only allowed one hit and the one hit was a home run but it was only a solo shot so it didn't do a lot of damage and they were still able to pull out the win so guys like Kenny Lipman and if Nigel Belgrave if he's able to be more consistent when he's hitting his spots he's unhittable so if he's able to figure it out Maryland's in business so yeah seven games left in the regular season before the postseason begins obviously we know last year Maryland hosted a regional. They didn't make it out of the regional, but they pushed it to a game seven. I'm curious. We'll, we can start with John and then go to Ben. You can kind of sign us off. 
where do you guys think this team fits in the postseason picture? And then maybe comparing them to last year, what do you think their ceiling is in terms of what they can achieve in the NCAA tournament? So I think that it's very slim that they end up hosting a regional. I personally am hoping they host a regional, but I think it's going to be very difficult because of RPI. If you know what RPI, RPI is, it's basically just a cumulative ranking of all baseball teams. They sit around 35 right now, and it's because if they lose a single game, even Big Ten tournament, they are not hosting. Like I think it's like 24 is like the lowest RPI or highest RPI you can have to host a regional. So I don't think it's likely to host a regional. I think they'll get a very high two seed. You see a lot of publications now ranking them almost in the teens, which is an indication that they're safely in the tournament, number one, and number two, that they will probably get a high two seed. But as of postseason ceiling, I think personally that this is probably the best Maryland team we've seen uh, maybe ever, one of the best at least. Uh, you don't, you're not going to have the tandem of Shaw, Schliger, LaRusso, and then just how deep this lineup is probably ever again, or, or at least for a very long time. So I think, I mean, Kendall Rogers of D1 Baseball said, I think this team can go to Omaha. And I really do think this team can go to Omaha if everyone performs at the peak they have, as you said, like the bullpen has stars in it. The starting rotation has stars in it. And we know what the offense can do. I think they can make it to Omaha, but I think that really it's one step at a time. I think the first thing that they need to do is prove that they can prove it in the big 10 tournament, something that they've never done in their history. If they can win in the big 10 tournament, I think it could be a testament of making it out of a regional, making it possibly out of a super region. Yeah, um, I agree with John totally. And in regards to the Big Ten tournament, I really think it's that it's their tournament to lose. They've proven it over the entire conference play. They won six in a row, and those six wins have included the few teams under them, which is Indiana, Rutgers, and Iowa. They've all they've beat they've beat them all multiple times, and I really think that if they're able to, the pitching's able to click, and this offensive. Uh, masterclass just continues that I think they're going to steamroll their way through the Big Ten tournament and then hoping that um, that momentum will carry into the NCAA tournament and while they did struggle in their non-conference play they did they they had a really tight game in, against Vanderbilt which was should have been a win but if they're able to compete with teams like Vanderbilt and they did beat teams like Ole Miss even though that they've kind of slacked off the second half of the year i think that they're real, they can make it to omaha great well you know we'll all be uh, excited to see how the uh, rest of the season plays out and for anyone listening or watching you can or andrew do you have one more before we sign yeah, off? i, I want to cut just, you off here no no you know because you uh ben and you mentioned the non-conference and i think we're recording this on monday and tomorrow maryland has a really really important midweek against a, a really solid northeastern team so can you guys just give us a, your quick initial thoughts on, on that mat, on that matchup and what challenges are, are presented? Yeah, well, from what I've seen is that they have one of the best staffs in the country. They've it's like in college baseball to have a three five ERA like staff is ridiculous, especially where the balls just fly. So it's gonna be like uh like an unstoppable object versus an immovable force or whatever you like the analogy on that. It's just a very it's gonna be a very fun matchup at the Bob. Um and the CAA, Maryland has played several CAA uh, opponents this year in Delaware um, and William and Mary. They flopped. I think this is going to be a really fun matchup. I think it's not going to be a walk in the park. And if they can get past Northeastern, I think that's the, really their final hurdle um, before the Big Ten tournament. Yeah, I agree. Especially like John said, they got a really strong uh, pitching staff. If they're able to prove that they can hit against a really deep staff, then it shows that they can just hit and score runs against anyone that they face that comes in their path. Yeah, well, thank you guys for coming on. Really appreciate it. Appreciate your time and all the insight. Uh, you can keep up to date with all of John and Ben's work at testudotimes.com and we'll have their social media and all that in the episode description. And thank you guys for coming on. Uh, looking forward to seeing your coverage on Tuesday. Thank you. Thank you, guys. Thanks, guys.